you don't have to answer. Later no. when we show your email, we show that great photo of you with yeah. the stethoscope and everything, yeah. but you look you look great. I okay. want to ask you this question because I did not know this. There are some medications that have substances in it that can not only take care of you maybe, but send you right to the emergency mm -hmm. room. And this comes from the CDC. This is absolutely incredible. One third of all the admissions to an emergency to emergency rooms across the country among older people one-third are due to three medications these are insulin for diabetes digitalis for heart and the third one is a blood thinner called warfarin now these medications are very important if you have atrial fibrillation if you've had a stroke if there's some reason to thin your blood, you need warfarin. Uh, if you have a, a, an erratic heartbeat, your heartbeat is too, uh, too quick, you need uh, digitalis. If you're a diabetic, uh, you need insulin. The thing is that if you're on any of these drugs, they all have to be monitored by your doctor very carefully. If you take too much warfarin, you will hemorrhage. And that can be tested in an easy blood test, which you should have at your doctor's suggestion. Uh, digitalis can, uh, excess can be monitored clinically and by an electrocardiogram. The tip off there is loss of appetite. If you're taking digitalis or losing your uh, appetite, it's very important to tell your doctor. And the uh, third one, I mean the insulin, uh, have your, you should, if you're a diabetic on insulin, you should have a monitor in your home where you can monitor your own sugar. People often take too much insulin and they come in in near coma in the emergency rooms. So those are the three important drugs which can cause severe problems. There, most of them are necessary, although I personally don't prescribe the Joxin as nearly as much as I used to. Those drugs are very important. The key is they have to be monitored. You can't sort of take them yourself and every six months uh, check with your doctor. <laughs> I just got to tell you, you have fans behind you. I don't know if you see <laughs> what's going on behind you. It's not just the person who wrote they're, in, they're Dr. Get, Rosenfeld. Get, get, we have another question. They get really there. excited at the Dr. <laughs> Rosenfeld's advice, I guess. Let's go to the email now. Judith Russo from Palm Desert, California, writes about statin gr drugs. She's very happy about how they've been able to deal with the cholesterol. But and we've heard about this, Doc. Do statin drugs affect memory? i got to tell you. I got to tell you, I don't know. <laughs> you don't uh, remember. I, I, <laughs> you know, there have been reports. I mean, the statins are wonderful mm -hmm. drugs. They've been shown to prevent heart attacks, stroke, they have all kinds of anti-inflammatory. And they're, if your cholesterol is high and there's no other way of reducing it, statins are great. There have been several studies showing or claiming that the statins affect memory. There have also been other studies that show that the statins do not impair memory. So what to do? If you notice a change in your memory, there's so many different causes of memory loss, ranging from Alzheimer's to, to uh, medication, to lack of sleep, to depression. But if you're on a statin drug and you think that there's something wrong with your memory, discuss it with your doctor. I just want to make one point about a statin drug. There was a recent report that one particular statin, Zocor, uh, the generic of which is simvastatin, interferes with sleep, may cause insomnia. If you've been started on this drug and you notice that you're not sleeping as well, tell your doctor about it. He or she may not have read this very recent report that implicates this drug in insomnia. I can tell you from personal experience that I'm on this drug and I thought my sleep was uh, was interfered with and I stopped it and replaced it and uh, I think I'm sleeping better. How do I look? I look rested. Very rested. Absolutely. Completely. <laughs> Something important that's important for somebody who's on Zocor sure. or Simvastatin. Good. Great advice. What I tell you, everybody is looking for a quick fix. Everybody wants to look young and feel young and the human growth hormone is very popular among many people or some people. The bottom line is this. I do not advise you to take it. Now, human growth hor hormone is produced by the pituitary gland in the brain. Uh, at age 40, the amount that's produced starts to go down. This has been the rationale for people saying, well, if the brain isn't making as much and we're getting older, let's replace it. So there is a synthetic product 
on the market. It's injectable. It's very expensive. And it, some people claim it makes them feel better. It increases their muscle mass. Uh, controlled studies do not document that. They may make your muscles bigger, but not stronger. People who exercise without the human growth hormone are much stronger than those who develop muscles as a result of the human growth hormone. Now, there's a downside to it. Uh, some people who take this human growth hormone uh, by injection develop diabetes, develop heart trouble, uh, develop other problems. I do not recommend it. If you want to stay young, fall in love. Eat the right food, lose weight, exercise. Get a good night's uh, sleep. Get, get a good night's sleep. But uh, I would not go this route at this time. All right, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rosenfeld, we wanted to ask you a question, and this question has come in as well from viewers, that honey may be very good for you. Maybe your mom or your grandmother told you to use it, not only when you have a cold, but for other reasons. It is a rich source mm. of antioxidants. I didn't know that. It is. It's ac actually is an antioxidant. It's rich in antioxidants. It uh, has some antibacterial uh, uh, properties. And, you know, we've talked about the FDA regulations and the CDC regulations saying that cough uh, medicines and cough syrups should not be given to children. Well, here is an excellent alternative. Uh, they've studied uh, buckwheat uh, honey, which is the darker, uh, thicker kind than you than you get, and they found that between the ages of uh, 1 and 18, uh, giving kids who are coughing and who have a cold, uh, you get a response. Now, you've got to know the do not give it to, there's been a lot of publicity about this honey recently, and the, one, why I wanted to discuss it today was to emphasize that you do not give honey to kids under one year of age. That's because some of this honey can contain a, an infection uh, that these kids cannot survive. So, start, if you, so by all means use it. After age one, a half teaspoon uh, at bedtime uh, 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 for kids with a cough or a cold. Uh, at age 12, one teaspoon. And after that, uh, uh, two teaspoons. Wow, they say that it's very soothing and it has antibacterial and antioxidant. All right, but not calories. under one. Good not to under know. one. And remember, do not use these over-the-counter cough medicines for kids with colds. All right, we're going to come back with more with Dr. Rosenfeld. In the meantime, some parts of the U.S. Oh, it is cold. It's snowing, and of course, that means flu season. Well, the temperatures are dropping, and everywhere you go, you hear people coughing and sneezing, and a lot of people are getting the flu, but is it just a cold weather bug or something we worry about more this time of year, but we should worry all year? No, you're right on, Jamie. It's a cold weather bug. It is. Yeah. Huh. Uh, we always wondered, how come the flu is more prevalent in the wintertime? Mm -hmm. And the theories were that, well, you know, in the wintertime, people uh, stay at home, they're together in the high humidity, and they transmit the infection to each other, and so on. In the spring, when we go out, we don't get the cold. Well, that's apparently wrong, because researchers have found that the flu virus thrives in cold, dry weather, much more than in warm, humid weather. And the reason is that the flu is transmitted, unlike the cold virus, which is transmitted by shaking hands and then touching your mouth, the flu virus is actually transmitted in the air, not by touch. And you breathe in uh, the, the, the flu that somebody else has coughed out. Now, in, in warm weather, the flu virus takes the, 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 the water in the, the, in the humidity and it gets heavy and drops to the ground. In cold weather, it doesn't absorb any liquid and it's stays fantastic. afloat. That's the current theory. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, it doesn't make any practical difference other than not, you know, touching and so on as you do for the cold. But what I want to do is, before we go is I want to emphasize the importance of taking, uh, getting a vaccination. The latest report is that people who develop the flu uh, are at twice the risk of a heart attack or stroke if they get the symptoms of it. So if you develop the flu, these other things are more likely to kill you. My suggestion is, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, 
please get vaccinated. And I read one very interesting twist that you can now get vaccinated at some airports after you pass security. They have little booths where you can be vaccinated. I've seen make those. Sure who's, I make got sure, mine, though. They I cost got. up to $35. Make sure who's giving them to you. I'm sure, sure these people mm -hmm. are screened. And make sure that you're not allergic to egg or pro chicken protein. Okay.